the, um, the topic of the day is uh, developing an integrated approach to compliance and risk management. So uh, organisations that want to comply with relevant standards, 27001, ISO 22301 for business continuity, some of you will know what these standards are, I'll talk about them in some more detail, and perhaps historically have used Excel as a way of helping to manage all of the different assessments against the controls and risk assessments that they do as part of that. And I want to show you another way um, that, we, that we tackle those, um, those challenges using our product stream. So I work for Acuity Risk Management, um, been with the company since the start, and I'll give you a bit of history about that uh, in a second. Um, my background though, I've um, been working in IT and security for 30 years, and the last eight years with Acuity, we were founded in 2005. The 22 years before that, and most of that time, I've been working in information security, and before that, in software development. Um, so, many of our, our clients uh, are trying to implement management systems, information security management systems to comply with 27001, and other management systems for other standards, including 9001, for quality management, and so um, what we uh, what we're trying to do is make that process more automated and manageable in a, in a complex business. This is our, our website, which you're very welcome to visit, and you'll see that uh, on here we can watch further demos if you want to look in more detail at, uh, at what Stream can do. And you can also download a free, completely free copy of the software. This is the way that we actually sell stream you can download a free copy and use it as much as you like uh, on in a single user basis and then organizations that want to then use the system on a server in a multi-user environment they come back to us and we, we provide and we quote uh, for multi-user systems and we sell those but anybody can download stream we have thousands of users around the world who use the product on a single machine for all sorts of uh, information information risk um, risk and compliance uh, applications. For free? For free. Yes. Yes, you'll see on the, on the website that we, we do offer a subscriber edition. People that want support and, and help from us and upgrades and things like that, but the free version is completely free. Okay, this is just uh, to give you an idea of some of the companies that, that we work with. These are all stream user organizations. Uh, from very large companies such as BP, who use Stream for a health and safety risk, so not information security, um, and other organisations here that use Stream for corporate risk and business risk, very, very different, or quality risk management. Um, but it's fair to say that most of the organisations um, here on the screen uh, use Stream for information security uh, related applications, 27001, PCI, COBIT, these are our, our most popular uses for stream. Okay, so the typical uh, organisation that we work with these days um, needs to comply with multiple standards. So in the past we would be approached, oh, I'm looking for a more efficient way of, um, of addressing 27001. I want to, be a cert want to be certified for some of my critical business processes and that was a typical requirement. These days uh, that's just one of many standards that a company is trying to uh, comply with and demonstrate that compliance with. So, so what we're trying to do now is implement an integrated management system rather than lots of separate initiatives. One management system that can handle the requirements of, of all of these different standards. 27,000, 9,014 for environmental risk management, 18,000 for health and safety. So this is a typical situation for us. And a lot of those companies that we speak to have, until now, used Microsoft Excel as their way of juggling all the information that is necessary to, to put together the management system and, and monitor what's going on and make improvements. Okay? And Excel is very, it's very good, but it's very quickly outgrown, uh, particularly in a complex business with lots of people involved. You just can't uh, see the wood for the trees and you can't manage um, the information efficiently and it can't scale. Um, so Excel has its limits. Um, as well, a lot of our, organ a lot of our customers 
will, will have a very wide variety of different methodologies they want to use and um, they want to configure that um, in the system they're going to use. So Stream is very configurable, which means they can set up the, the schemes that they want to use rather than being forced to use something that we might define. Um, and what they're looking for is a very efficient way of doing all of these activities on an ongoing basis. Okay. So we're into acronyms, and this is what, uh, what STREAM stands for. Notice that there's no word security in there. Um, STREAM is an assurance management solution, so it's for, for companies that want assurance in different aspects of their of their management across their enterprise, across an enterprise, um, but to allow them to work in a risk-based approach. And certainly um, ISO 27001 requires a risk-based approach in order to be compliant with that standard. So what, what parts of my business are within the scope of my initiative? What are the critical assets? What are the key systems and information, third parties, um, and my staff and my premises? that are within the scope, and what are the risks um, that, uh, that could affect those critical assets, and how, how am I treating those risks. So a risk-based approach is essential. And I think even more important, in order to engage senior management uh, so that they can make strategic decisions about where improvements need to be made, we need to give them good visibility of risk status. So hence, strategic approach. So that is what Stream is all about, um, and the way that it works, in essence, is that you will decide how you want to structure the different views of risk and compliance across your business. On the screen, I have an example organisation, ABC Corporation, which is regional, so we've got a European uh, area, an America's area, and some corporate services. This could be any hierarchy, of course. And that's then broken down into, in my case, business units, which are in those different regions. And what we need to, to do in order to have good risk-based assurance is, is ultimately to be able to take any of those different business units or regions, so at any level in this tree, and see some key information. How many risks do we have? So in this example, in this UK trading function, I can see from this little graphic here, there are 10 risks on the risk register for that part of the business. Some are red, some are amber, some are green. So I can see that some risks need further treatment, clearly. I'd like them all to be green, if I, if I could. Um, on the right-hand side, we can see here that the, uh, the controls which are in place to mitigate those risks are just about in what you might think of as the green zone. So on average, the controls that mitigate those 10 risks are nearly where I could say healthy. But you can see there's a lot of room for improvement there. So only just. And because they're only just in the green zone, I've got some red risks. And it could be that some key controls for those risks are not uh, sufficiently healthy. Um, so we can see our, our risk and control status just on a simple graphic. Uh, this gauge in the middle is showing a much more interesting view, I think, of risk, which is that I'm able to define a risk appetite, which I'll talk about a bit later. So for this particular part of the business, UK Trading, I've configured that my risk appetite here um, is uh, 1,500 units. Now in my case, I'm able to express my risk appetite financially. This is a commercial organisation, they, they, they make money and they make a certain amount of money in a year, and a percentage of that profit that they make, they can say, well, my risk appetite is that I will, if I lose no more than this in the context of what I'm expecting to make, because of security incidents, then that, 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 will, that I will accept. So what they're saying is that they will um, accept a tolerable level of loss of 1,500 units, so 1 1.5 million pounds per annum. This is in the context of making an awful lot more than that as, as, as in, in business. So a small percentage is their risk appetite. And what we can do is we define that risk appetite and then we can measure on this gauge how close they are to it. So if the, the red needle here is, is, is straight up, that's 100%. So that would be on appetite. Now I'm to the right of that. I'm actually running at 161% of my 
management defined risk appetite, my tolerable level of loss for this business unit. So, so I can see how many risks there are, whether they're all green or not, my control status and how the aggregate level of risk compares with my risk appetite. Now not all organisations can define a risk appetite in this way, but where they can, it provides a very useful way to show uh, management where they're at in terms of their risk um, treatment. So imagine if you could view that sort of information at any point in your business and also knowing that the data is drawn from the usual risk assessments and control assessments that are carried out anyway in detail all the time across the business but aggregated up to this sort of visibility. That's what, um, what Stream is about, providing that visibility to business. In fact if you want to be compliant with 27001 for your business. This is exactly the sort of view that management needs. You just have to collect it in some way. And this is how it's done uh, using stream. Okay? And of course the purpose of doing this is to have assurance. Management needs assurance that we are compliant with the standards we need to be. And here I'm just showing a view which is just an aggregate rolled up view of how um, healthy the controls are in each section of something like 27,001. So a simple graphic. Um, and I find this sort of information far more interesting from a business point of view. But yes, you can still see certain sections are in better um, health than others within the standard. We want assurance we comply with the standard. There's obviously work to do here. We want assurance that the controls are effective, which I'll come on to and show you how we tackle that. It's a much more difficult requirement to, to meet. And that overall, our risk management is effective. And it's incumbent on an organisation to demonstrate to auditors that what they're doing is effective um, in terms of their risk management. Okay. So the way that we do this is we have a, a, a base product. The single user version is free, which you can download. Um, the enterprise version we install on a server and then you load into that base product the standards that you want to comply with. So in our store you can see we have things like PCI as content which is installed into uh, um, a stream system. Uh, 27001 is another example and what I want to show you to keep this really interesting is to show you how that is done. So in a, in a short while I'll start with a clean system, import some standards and show you how we can build up uh, an integrated management system. That's my, my plan today. Okay, so just before we, we do that, having introduced what it is, these are the components of the system. So we have a risk component, so we can define um, the different threats that could affect our assets. So in a security management system, you know, hacking, human error, um, unavailability caused by adverse weather, all these different threats to our assets that could affect information, um, disclosure, integrity and um, availability, CIA. We can configure in the different control standards that we want to comply with to help us to address those risks. We can also track incidents and near misses and these are all essential components of uh, an information security management system incidents and near misses that again affect our assets and the information that they are storing, processing and communicating. Um, and also uh, in Stream we can measure the performance of our key controls um, by defining metrics around those key controls and again more examples coming up. Um, and you'll notice in the middle of this graphic we have asset management because of course you can't do any of these things until you know what your assets are. And the very first stage of, of implementing any uh, information security management system is to define the scope of it and then identify what your business assets are within that scope. So we plant that firmly in the middle of, of the software and then you can identify the risks to your assets, assess the controls that are applicable to your assets. If there are incidents or near misses, raise them in relation to assets and measure performance of controls that are protecting assets. It's all about the assets. And that's a very important uh, point because of course businesses change all the time. So how do, we, how do we handle that? Well, when new assets are 
introduced to the business, new systems, new sites, new teams, they are entered into stream and then we can continue to assess the new risks to those assets. And also if assets are retired, become out of scope, then the risks are no longer applicable. So by maintaining an asset model of the business at, an, at a suitable level of detail, which I'll explain um, how we do that, then we maintain our ISMS um, accordingly. So we've got some, sorry, question. Sorry to interrupt you. Are we talking about the life cycle in here? I yes, mean, where I mean, we start from and where, what we... Yes, I mean, if you think about the plan, do, check, act yeah. life cycle, that's the diagram most people would use here. Um, and what this is effectively is the key components that underpin that. So in order to plan the controls you need, you first need to define your scope and uh, identify your assets. <coughs> then you can see which controls are applicable, which you can then assess. So plan is, is covered. Yeah. Do, of course, is, is carrying out those assessments. Check and act is seeing if the controls are effective, which is where you pick up things like instance and nemesis here. So plan, do, check, act underpins this. It's just another way of looking at it. Okay. But these are the components of our, of our software which allow you to, to hold that information and maintain that model in, real, in reality. Um, so there's another slide that follows which shows more of the, the life cycle. So what you can create here is an integrated solution um, which integrates compliance and risk and the ability to measure ongoing effectiveness and respond. It's, uh, it's actually a Microsoft SQL Server database with all of the linkages um, for these objects defined within it. And the way that we use um, the software, as I've mentioned before, is we load into it the risk types, the threat lists that are, that are relevant to what we're trying to do and the control standards that are relevant before we start. And I'll show you how we do that in a minute. And what you get is an integrated management system. There's no reason why you shouldn't introduce uh, threats to security, business continuity and quality all together and have an integrated solution. And all of those standards follow the PDCA model and that's the way the standards authorities are moving to standardise on the elements of that model. Okay, I've mentioned the importance of an asset based approach and uh, you'll see how that works in, in, a, in a second. Okay, so um, those are the core elements of our approach and around those core elements are these key processes and this again helps to bring uh, the plan do check out processes to life. So um, it, is, it is important and that you can raise improvement actions in relation to any of this. So if we have uh, risks that need further treatment we can raise an action to, to make sure that's done. Um, controls that are weak or missing, we can raise an action. So in relation to any part of this model, we can raise an action, assign it to somebody, um, set dates on things, so there's a workflow going on to make the processes um, work. Um, people get reminders. Everybody who connects to this system as a user has an appropriate role, so we can configure which parts of the model they can get to in relation to our business. Okay, so this this brings the whole thing to, to life. Okay. Uh, architecturally, um, the database will sit on a, on a server here, and then we'll have an application server to, to manage the licensing and, and, and access to the database. Um, and uh, you can actually run a, a stream client either on a, a Windows machine, you can install it and then connect to the, to the database and, and use the software, uh, or you can use a browser or in fact you can run um, the client on any mobile device, iPad, iPhone, although it's small. <laughs> um, so any, any connected device uh, can be used to, to, with, with stream. Okay, so now I'm showing you a few more examples here. This is the, the typical uh, setup where you have multiple uh, control standards um, configured into the software. So this is a screenshot from the control framework part of, of the software, which I'll show you uh, shortly. So we've imported a number of uh, ISO standards. So you can see uh, 27,001 there. Not just the Appendix A, which contains the, uh, the best practice controls, um, but also the ISMS requirements themselves, which also need to be um, 
record your response against those, how it's being done, link to relevant documentation, etc. So we've got 27,001 in there. 22301, which is the business continuity uh, management system standard, and 9001. I want to show you or build that uh, live um, in, a, in a few minutes. So um, these first three items here, pretty standard. We want to import the controls we'd like to work with, how we want to assess them. So you might decide to use a, a, a percentage. Is this control in place? Zero, no, 100% yes, or something in between. Not very objective though. You can also define a COBIT type maturity assessment um, for a control. Or we can def define various drop downs as we wish, a yes, no, partial, or, or something a bit more uh, um, interesting. So I'll show you some, some example schemes again shortly. And of course, we want to be able to configure who's allowed, who we want to assess different controls. All of that is, is part of the, uh, the system. And then some slightly more interesting uh, requirements here. There could be common controls in these different standards. Certainly if you start combining PCI with 27001, there are overlaps. So it's possible to link things together and therefore not have to assess the same control twice in more than one standard. Um, we can also decide what level of granularity we're going to assess controls. So with uh, 27001, you could just decide to assess all of those clauses once for your business. But of course, a lot of the controls are for sites or for systems or for teams. So you might decide to assess those controls per site that's within your business, per system, per team. So setting that level. And we call those, um, those objects asset classes, types of asset. And there's a certain set of asset classes that really sort of runs through 27001, networks, applications, operating systems, teams, sites, rooms. That set of classes we set up in stream, and I'll show you how. And then we can make linkages with the controls. So it's very easy then to, to decide which controls are applicable to your assets through the classes. Uh, it's also possible to build uh, custom views across the standards. If you're familiar with PCI, which I have in the, in the list here, um, we can, this is actually version 2 of PCI, version 3 has just come out. In this screenshot, we've, we've plugged in version 2 of PCI um, and we've built a, a scorecard, which is effectively the prioritised approach, the milestone view of the PCI controls. It's a linkage between the controls and the standard for reporting purposes. So here, if you assess all of the PCI controls for a particular PCI scope within your business that's processing um, credit card uh, details data, then I can view that compliance uh, from the milestone perspective or from the straight structure of the standard. That's an example of a of a scorecard, a custom view across my controls. So I can then pull up these sorts of uh, these sorts of views. This actually is um, for my whole business. So I've configured a business structure in here, uh, different regions again different business units and looking across the whole business at all of the standards in there I can then see a bar for each one and see how, how I'm doing. It's also possible to drill down into individual standards and look at different parts of the business so you can really see where, where, where issues are and where there are common um, weaknesses. Okay, So getting into a bit more detail now on, on how we build these views. This is an example of a much bigger organisation, how you might represent it within software. And what we have is a tree structure, called it the enterprise tree structure. So you start with your, your business at the top. And it doesn't matter if this is a, an SME or a very large corporate, you, know, you can build an appropriate tree structure to the level of detail that you want. So in this example, I've got, again, European, Americas, and Australia element to my business. So these are groups. These dark blue um, folders are groups. Um, groups can be broken to subgroups, North America, California. And, and then I get to the stage where I actually want to um, create risk registers or, or where I'm going to put my risks, define my assets. So I've got assets, the business that are um, based in San Francisco, you know, certain systems and applications and teams. And these are light blue folders, risk registers. Uh, and they belong in the groups. So effectively, this is like the organization chart, and uh, there'll be 
key stakeholders in the business that are responsible uh, for each of these, these parts of the business. And so I can, having built this model, assign my users and my managers into the model as well so they get visibility at the right level of detail. So it's just an example. And you can see here that UK is broken down into further groups um, of risk types and then these risk registers here. Okay, so we build a model that is going to be useful to monitor the situation in our business. And what you then get, you'll recognize this, uh, this dashboard again, I showed you the gauges before. I can then look at those gauges and the detail that underpins them for any level in that structure. So this is actually the top level view, you can see it's for ABC Corporation, and I can see across the board that I have uh, in this example, it's only an example, 37 risks, sort of even spread really of red, amber and green. Just above my risk appetite here, I want to get back to here and the controls really aren't very good yet on average across. And the idea is I can drill down into this structure and see um, where those problems are. But just looking at the, the breakdown here in the table, you can see that the three top level groups which are strategic and operational risks, corporate risks and supply chain risks, you can see there's an entry for each of those groups in the table. And it's this first one here, which is sort of in the red as far as comparison with its risk appetite. So I can see there are, there are un unacceptable risks in this area, which is this top part here. So that visibility is important. But now I'm going to just select another one, trading. If I click on that, then you can see here um, a, an actual risk register. So right down in the, in the detail now, these are the risks to my assets, the threats which could affect my assets. So I've got things like uh, corruption or loss of data affecting applications, uh, failure of critical services, a particular critical service there, uh, and different uh, viruses, different sorts of threat, which I've defined in my catalogue, actually being linked to the assets of the business. So each of these items is, is a risk in my risk register. And actually, you know, it's no different to what you would have if you were using Excel. You know, you've got each row is a risk. But the way they've got there is from my asset um, list, the configured threats and the linkages that, that create those risks onto these registers. And of course, I can, I can see that anywhere in the business and it's aggregated up in the system. So just taking an example of a risk, if I just pick this one, um, deliberate misuse by an authorised user. So an authorised user within the trading team but using this application in a way that they're not supposed to. This is one risk that we are considering. Um, you can see that there are seven number of controls. There are seven controls, uh, in this case in 27001, which we have set our key controls to mitigate this risk. Um, those controls are not really in great health. They're averaging 59% uh, effective, so middle, middle effective. They're dragging down my average here. Uh, it's a red risk, and it's overdue as far as anyone accepting it. This risk needs attention. I can drill down here and have a look at that risk on its own and see what those seven controls are. So this is now what we call a risk dashboard. So this is the one risk, deliberate misuse of this application. Here are the seven controls drawn from 27001 with their references here. And you can see which ones are, are um, healthy and not. So this first one, percentage of staff that has signed acceptance of security obligations, 25%. So there's a problem and I can see exactly where that is. And the idea is of course that um, starting from the top down I can drill down through this structure, I can see where my red risks are, and then I can explore them in detail and find out which controls are weak and deal with those, make sure there are actions on them. So it's a drillable uh, interface for exploring uh, areas of high risk. Okay, now at the heart of it, you know, when you're assessing a risk, there's nothing particularly sophisticated there. What we have is a an impact component and a likelihood component. This is the way that most simple uh, risk assessments are, are performed. You, know, you decide what scale you want to use for impact, whether it's financial, qualitative, 
um, and what scale you want to use for likelihood. You define a grid. And that's all we're really doing uh, in the software. You configure your own preferred scales. And then each risk is assessed with an impact and a likelihood and given a colour. So it's a very simple um, system. Now, of course, for information security, we want, to, we want to make an impact and likelihood calculation for confidentiality um, impact, integrity and availability. So it's not just a single impact. So if we take a threat like misuse or abuse, the way that this is presented to the user is that they can record uh, a separate CINA impact. So this, this uh, risk assessment, I understand what it is, this threat affecting this asset, I can then say whether I would expect that to give me um, a high, um, medium, low, very low confidentiality, integrity, and availability impact separately, and how likely that threat is. So we record it per impact type. Okay? But each of those um, pairings of impact and likelihood is still using the same simple table. We're just aggregating up the different impacts. Okay. So that's an example of the sort of dialogue that you would be completing for an information security risk, where CINA are the different types of impact. If you're using, uh, if you're putting in risks of a different types, so business continuity type risks, where all your emphasis is on availability, but perhaps over different periods, then it looks slightly different. So a business continuity risk, such as unavailability of a, of a workplace here, uh, we've configured different impact types. So uh, hours, days, weeks, months, and longer periods. So I can say, well, uh, would loss of this workplace cause me a high um, unavailability impact after an hour or after a day? As the time period increases, the impact increases. And the rate at which it increases you know, defines how critical uh, that particular workplace is. So again, it's just a different scheme, to suits different um, type of risk. And the, the, the point I, I want to get across is that within the same system, we can configure multiple risk assessment schemes to handle the sorts of risks that we want to assess within, this, uh, within the system. Okay, so information security risks and business continuity risks all together. And hence, the, an integrated system for multiple uh, types of risk. Okay. Um, if I'm going to define a scheme for quality management system, and I'm taking a risk-based approach, then I might define my impact types as commercial. So let's say I'm producing a product and it suffers quality problem. I could have a commercial impact, a reputational impact, a legal impact. You know. Depends what products I'm producing. So again, you can define stream forces you to think about um, what types of impact you should be considering when you're assessing the risks. And they're going to be different depending on the, the types of risk you're looking at. So that's, that's what I'm showing you here. Uh, there's also some automation built in. So for example, if I want to, I can define, um, I can configure in the system what would we would consider a typical likelihood for this threat. So this threat is workplace unavailability. And obviously the user can make their assessment. But if you've got a team of people out in the business making their assessments, it's actually quite difficult to ensure consistency. Um, particularly with a likelihood assessment, it's notoriously difficult to ensure consistency of assessment when someone is saying, oh, how likely is this threat? And what we can do um, in, in the system is we can configure in the setup of it what we believe is typical for our business environment. And that's then advised here. It's advised to the user to take into account when they're doing this. Um, they can ignore it, in which case they should justify that in their comments, or they could take that guidance and then you, you, you know, you, you're encouraging that consistency and if somebody wants to do anything different they can justify it. So it really helps to, uh, to, to keep a consistent approach when you're looking at different threats. Um, and of course the system um, keeps a history, so every time I um, assess a risk, Data goes in, who did it, which user, um, and all of that rationale is, is retained. Okay. Um, I can also record management acceptance of risks, as you, as you would expect. All of this is part of the 
um, the user workflow. Okay, and just quickly, I'm going to get into a demo, but just to show you the sorts of views, uh, and this is uh, the point. We want visibility of how the situation changes over time, so I can look at views such as top 10 risks at any part of my business, um, how risk has changed, so this just shows you, it's a different uh, model, but just as an example, this is showing how risk has actually reduced in different parts of my business over a period of time. And I can look at all these sort of um, reports by month, by quarter, by year, for different parts of my business. And of course, if risks have, have come down, it's probably because controls have improved. So I can look at uh, my control history and how my compliance has improved. So all of this, this, this views are things that are very difficult to, to pull out of your spreadsheet approach. Um, but they are available because of a database that links all the objects together and retains um, history. Um, from the user point of view, when somebody logs into the system, this is the, the page that they get. Um, so again, as an example, uh, the user that's logged in, and uh, they're presented with a summary of risk, control, and event information that's relevant to that individual, depending on where they are defined in the hierarchy. So this user can see that within their area of responsibility, there are 67 risks and quite a lot of red. So that, that immediately sets the, the tone uh, for there's some work to do. And then when they click on these buttons, go to risks, it opens up the relevant part of the tree structure they can drill down and see what's going on. Same for controls. Uh, in fact, most of the controls this person's interested in are actually green, which probably means then that the controls that are weak, these few, are the ones which are raising these risks. And you can see all that information clearly when you start to drill down through the, the dashboards. And I can also see that certain incidents and the emissions have been raised and they're being tracked through these different stages here. Okay, so the three main uh, areas, risks, controls and events, all uh, summarised on this home screen per user. The bottom part of the screen is for things with dates on, so scheduled activities that this user needs to deal with. So I can see that there are risks I should be assessing. Um, and basically we've got uh, blue, blue items which haven't been dated. So there's been no date set on that. That's a, a problem in itself. Uh, and then certain things that are either coming up in the near future, which are green, uh, due within the next few weeks, which is amber, and late, which is red. So when I log in, anything that's red, I should deal with straight away. Anything that's amber, I should be thinking about dealing with. And green things, I know are coming up. So it's just keeping those, those activities to do with risks, assessments, acceptances, control assessments, approvals, can approve controls as well as assess them, uh, and uh, general actions. So a personal workflow for each user. And this again helps to keep the plan to check out life cycle turning. Uh, of course a senior user will have visibility of the areas below so they can see all the actions that um, their teams are going to be getting on their personal dashboards. Okay. Right. So now, sort of looking at how all this works, I mentioned that we define different classes of asset and that this is how um, the, the various risks are generated in the applicable controls when we define an asset by virtue of its class. And this is an example of the, uh, of the different types of, uh, of asset that we would typically have in the system. So for information security purposes, that's this side, I've got different types of information of course, customer data, financial, technical, different types of data. And in an ISMS context, you're going to be trying to identify broad categories of information that fall into these sorts of classes. We've got people assets. Now, I could split it. I could have end users and technical teams, administrators, different sorts of users with different risks. Just kept it very simple here. So people, uh, business applications, effectively, business information systems, uh, different sorts of platform, so I've got data servers, web servers which have special risks because they're vulnerable to the outside world, uh, different sorts of network, mobile devices, so uh, IT items, physical assets, buildings, rooms, third parties, uh, etc. So we, we 
prepare an appropriate set of classes and we link those classes in to the relevant standard. This isn't a typical set of classes for 27001. <clears throat> Notice I've got the organisation itself, because when you say within the scope of my business I have an organisation, it's that organisational entity that many of the, um, the broader controls will, will apply to, so information security policy, computer misuse, you know, acceptable use policy, all of these sort of disciplinary, all of those um, policies will be at the organisational level. Other controls are at the building level or at the system level, the platform level for teams. So by defining the classes, it helps to focus where we're going to be assessing the controls at what level of granularity. Yeah, and I've seen um, too many um, assessments, you, you could call it a gap analysis, I've seen too many gap analyses carried out for 27,001 where each control is just considered once for the business. Oh, do we do backups? Mm, yes. Uh, do we have uh, physical security? Yes. And you, you know, it's very hard to, to, to make that kind of assessment unless you consider it at the point where the control is applicable. Um, but quite often these things are done at a broad level uh, when what you need to do is consider well, which of our sites are secure, which of our systems have the backups that are effective. It's, 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 uh, it's often the case that you're thinking of an example where the control is in place rather than is it fully deployed for all of my platforms. So we very much encourage a focus on the assets of these types when you're looking at the controls to see if they're really effective. Slightly more detailed but then it gives you a more accurate picture of risk and allows you to see where the hotspots are. Otherwise, it's all too, too broad to really see where the risks are. Um, so that's for 27,001. The sort of classes we would expect for something like um, 22,301, business continuity, are critical sites, critical teams, critical third parties, critical technology. So you don't have to go uh, into um, any more detail than that. For quality assurance, I think it's important to identify what are the end products or services that are within the scope of your quality management system, um, the system itself, and then of course where we receive products and services from third parties that we integrate into our own products and services, those are also important. And if you identify those, then we've linked the various clauses of ISO 9000 in this case into those different um, assets. Okay, so if I put in 10 products, then certain clauses I need to consider 10 times, which of course is exactly what you should do in a, in a, in a thorough analysis of your controls for that business. Okay, so it's an example, but it's pretty typical for an integrated management system. Can we add class if we, I mean, in the future if we needed to add any class? Can we add yes, it here? Yes, it's completely editable uh, within the system. You can edit. It's, it's all under what we call the framework. You can edit the classes, the controls, the threats, and link them all together completely flexibly. And um, as I'll show you in a minute, you can also import all of this with its linkages to make it quicker. We have these pre-built uh, applications that we can just import and assemble within the system. But yes, the user can change it, any of this, any time. And so what you might do is, as, as um, you maintain and management system over the years, of course, new threats emerge. Um, the standards change, new controls come in, some controls go out, and new types of asset will emerge too. And it's really important that all of these things are um, maintainable. Right. Okay, so I thought now would be a good time to, to show you something real. I've been talking for a while. Um, so in this uh, example, I'm going to start with a blank database so that you can see the process of configuring it for different purposes. I hope you'll find this interesting. So what I have in this folder here is a shortcut just to launch a, uh, a blank database. So I'm just going to log in um, with the user Stream. Stream is a sort of default administrator um, in the system. So I'll be able to get to all the screens. So if I just go full screen here, then you can see that it's the, it's the uh, expected home screen, but there's nothing in there because, of course, this is an empty database. So now you can see the menu structure. And what I will need to do before I can use this is configure all these different settings. 
So how do I want to assess my risks? Uh, how do I want to assess my controls? And when I'm raising incidents, so events, how do I want to categorize them? So all of these need to be configured. Uh, in terms of my framework, which is where the question just was, there are certain threat lists, control sets, and asset classes. Now, if I look at these menus now, there are no threats at all in there. Okay, no threats. Uh, no control standards, and no asset classes. It's a completely empty system. And all of these other menus here are the linkages between those things. So now if I wanted to, I could go in and start adding them in manually. But what I want to show you is that we can push those in as pre-prepared um, pieces of content. So what I have um, here on my desktop, if I can just find it, um, is um, what we call a content uploader, which is pre-prepared content for 27,001, 9,001, etc. And we have quite a few that I can choose from here. Now, I thought it would be useful to pick maybe two or three of these, so 27,001. So if I just open that um, up, it's basically a, uh, a structured workbook where the elements of the framework that we want to import are captured on the different sheets within the workbook. And I can upload those into my stream system. So that's really how it's done. If I go back into the system now and have a look on my framework, I now see a whole set of information security threats, which I've just pushed in. Um, it's a shortcut the process of typing them all in individually, which of course you can do here. You can add sections, these are sections, and I can add threats into them. So now I've got, for example, some information security threats that could affect applications, corruption of data, deliberate misuse, that a bit by insiders and outsiders. Uh, for platforms, I've got DOS, attacks, viruses, hacking, all those sorts of things. So it's a, a set of threats for information security. What I see on the controls framework side is these new elements that I've just pushed in from Excel. So the different clauses of 27001 are in there. The Appendix A controls. This is actually the 95 edition, but uh, we have them all. And a set of key control indicators for measuring if controls are effective. So that's all gone in. And the classes, also part of the framework that I showed you before. So they're all in there, as well as all the linkages between them. So just to show you an example, uh, the linkage between threats and those classes, if I pick uh, a class uh, web server, for example, then in the middle you see here, the four threats from my catalogue that I've said could affect web servers. I've just dragged them across effectively, but it's all predefined. Okay? And there's no reason why you shouldn't make other linkages and add other threats and link them any time that you want to. Okay, so I've pushed that in. I've also pushed in a risk assessment scheme called information security, which has the CI and A elements and an appropriate impact scale. All of the things that I need have come in from, from that workbook. So just to go back to the, uh, the folder and maybe choose another one, uh, 22301, this is the business continuity standard. I'm gonna do the same with that, upload that as well. And, uh, and then finally, maybe something a bit different, ISO 9000, just to upload that too. So we, we prepare these, these sets of content and then you can just assemble them into your system. So now in stream, I have a different sorts of risk assessment scheme for different purposes. I have different control assessment schemes for assessing different standards. I have in my framework um, further threats. I've got business, business continuity related threats there in amongst my uh, security ones. Um, and lots of control standards now. Well, it's growing. The list is growing. But that's how we how we do it. So, when we uh, engage with a new customer, and find my slides again. We start with a blank system, and we say, "Well, what what do you need to comply with?" And of course, the, it's the first stage uh, for management to identify what it is that they're trying to comply with, which regulation, which standards in the context of their business. So I've just showed you that one actually, 
that I can very quickly set up a system uh, to, to support ISMS, BCMS, QMS framework okay, within, within one system. And what we'll then do, is there, is there a question? No. What we'll then do is we'll say, well, let's now move on to this, the structure of the business in which we're going to um, manage these, these standards. So I go back to here. Um, so we've effectively we've finished with the, the settings okay, and the framework because all that's been, been pushed in as content. So we're moving on now to scoping our um, use of, of the system. And the first item on the scope menu is to define that tree structure as you would expect. And once we've done that, we can then identify our assets. So it's just following the flow of what uh, is, is needed. So the tree structure at the moment is empty. So uh, obviously I can, I can change this to be my own, my own company names. I'll, I'll leave it with, uh, with ABC in there for now. And what I want to do is add groups and registers, which are the two things that you can add here, to build that, uh, that structure. So if I just start doing this, so maybe uh, ABC1, the first part of my business will be um, the UK uh, part of my business. I'll just add that as a group. Add another one, ABC2 USA. So I'm just building it up. And, uh, and then perhaps if I want to add in something at the level of UK, so I'm building another level, perhaps north and south. So we have some north and south divide in, the, in here. So I'll put north first and then um, UK2 is south. And then I can keep building, obviously, but let's put in some registers. So within the south, I'll have my first risk register, and I'm going to have a London business unit of some kind, London BU. And I want to use this risk register for tracking information security risk. So we need to commit to the sorts of risks we want to assess in this register at the point of creating the register. Now obviously, if I wanted to have lots of risks of different types, I'd create a register for each. And it's important that we, um, we, we make that selection because when you're assessing these risks, it's a different scheme you're using with different impact types. So we do have to commit um, to the types of risks in the individual register. Right, so that's how I, how I build it up. It's quite simple. Now if I have um, a very, very complex business, then again, I can import this. There's no need to rekey it. Um, and uh, we have a template for, for laying out this kind of uh, hierarchy in, in Excel and then just pushing the whole thing into, um, into stream. So as with all of these bits of data, they can be, they can be imported if, if, if it's easier. So that's how we, uh, we set up the, the hierarchy. I, I won't do any more, but you can see um, how that works. Um, and then what we can do is move on to defining assets. So now uh, I have uh, a screen where eventually all of my business assets will be um, displayed here. Or I can manage them and make sure they, they're correct as time goes by. Um, if I want to add an asset, um, then I just need to decide where it belongs in the business, which parts of the business depend on it, are going to suffer from a security point of view if that asset is affected by a threat, um, and what it is. So um, I'll just put in something very simple here. I'll put in my organisation first. So the top level, I have my organisation. So I'll put that in, and this is going to be org, uh, and it's ABC Corporation. So that's my, my first asset, the organisation itself, to which the many of the ISO 27001 clauses will be applicable. Um, now I'm going to put in something a bit more, bit more detailed. Uh, perhaps within the UK I have a network, perhaps, so some sort of wide area network. So I'll say it's a UK network. So UK net, maybe it's the first of many. Um, ABC Corporation UK wide area network. So that's a network. It's quite high level this, but this is the level that uh, you would typically uh, tackle um, 
something like 27,001. There's no need to go into all the routers and the hubs and the switches. That isn't what we're doing. It's, it's high, relatively high level assets to make sure that the, the controls are identified. Um, so now I've got um, two assets, the organisation and the network. So a few more. Let's add one into London. So in London, let's say we have a team. So I'm going to have uh, a London asset. I'm starting to use a naming convention here, so where it is and what it is. So team, first team, this could be trading team, for example. Um, I'm going to add a few more things in London so you can start to see how this works. A system, a business information system that that team uses. So um, it's London, it's a business information system, and it could be a trading application. Okay. And now I'll add some physical assets. So in London there's a site, so perhaps my my London HQ. Okay. And finally I'll put in a third party. Just so I've got a bit of variety there. Again, I'll make this something that is only used by the London office. So London third party one, maybe some sort of um, reference data supplier for my trading. I mean, it's just an example, some sort of third party service, which is part of that business. So if I apply that, if I now look at um, the top of the tree and the top of this tree, I'm looking at all of my assets. So I've entered in some London assets, um, a top level organisation and a UK asset. It's not rocket science, this, um, to identify your assets, but it's important to do it and it's important to consider uh, these sorts of assets for something like 27,001. From going into business continuity or quality, then I've got different sorts of assets which I'm going to be putting in. But this is the process and it's relatively straightforward. So those are then part of my asset register. And I can come back to this screen anytime I like and add some more. I can also define my various users. At the moment, I've just got myself stream. Excuse me. Yes. Before we move from the assets, mm. where can we design, uh, assign the values for the assets here? If oh, I need to know yes. such an asset has so so value, yes. where would I add it here? Um, well, you, that's really part of the risk assessment. And so you do that here as part of the risk assessment. Okay, so what we're doing on this screen is just scoping the business. And we're saying within our business, we have these assets. And then but when we're looking at the risk part yeah. in due course, we will then be able to record impacts, potential impacts in relation to those. So it's just done a bit later on in the process. But that's right, that's, that's something we've, which we will need to do. Okay. Now, obviously, as part of identifying the assets, um, you, can, um, you can say who's responsible for them and you can describe them in more detail. And you might want to start putting that data in as a text field, but the formal impact assessment will follow as part of the risk assessment later on. Okay? Um, actually, while I'm in here, uh, notice that we have these assets, which are clearly special because they're a different colour. Uh, we've designated, uh, for information security, we've designated the information types themselves as primary assets. And this is a distinction that is um, a term that's used often, information security, primary and secondary. So it's the information that is of primary importance to the business. All of these other asset types are purely the infrastructure, whether it's physical, technical or, per or people, that, that processes, stores and communicates that information. So as part of our asset discovery, uh, work, uh, we should identify not just that infrastructure but also the types of information that we're dealing with. So I'm going to add in some information to this business process. I'm going to add into London the sort of information this team is working with and in this case it's financial. Okay, So I'm going to choose that category. So again this is London and it's data rather than infrastructure. Uh, trading data, in fact. Okay, And of course, I can customise these lists. So if I'm preparing this um, 
for a hospital environment, then I'd want patient data as one of my categories, for example. So you would customize the classes to suit the particular business. These are quite general ones, but you can add your own. Um, so now I've got um, some infrastructure, some data uh, for my business, all defined as assets. Okay, that's the where we've got to. So I'll make sure I'm not missing a step. So we've created the structure and we define some assets. Okay, so this is the step. And of course, if you have a very complex um, business, then you'll divide this task up. And what I was about to show you when we had that, that question was that um, the way this is intended to be used is that I can define other users. So if I defined um, another user, I create a user called Richard, I give them a password which they can then change when they log in, put in their email address so that they get the email alerts and the whole kind of workflow kicks in around that. Uh, and then I choose the different roles they have. Now these roles essentially uh, give access to the relevant menus. So if I want this user to be able to add further assets in or develop that tree further, then I will give them scope user role. Okay, so if I say user Richard will be a scope user, I can then say which parts of my model they can use that menu in. So if I said this user was a USA user, then when they log in they can add the tree structure below USA, they can define that structure in their part of the business and they can then define the assets of it. So that's the way this works. And um, it's really, what I really like doing is when we've deployed this in a big company and we're doing the training, is to get the users in the room all logged in, create their rights and then say, right, now in this workshop, log in and develop the tree structure assets for your part of it. It's great to see the tree growing uh, sort of at the front and seeing the assets arriving. And it's amazing how quickly, when you've got that collaboration, this can be done for quite a complex business area. And then see the whole thing building up on the dashboards. It's really good. Um, of course, it's just me here, so you're seeing a very slow sort of snail pace. But you get get the idea. So the the real uh, power here is when you you can share that work across the business. So I have a um, essentially a role for each menu, which allows people to contribute uh, depending on what 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 they're doing in the business. Okay. I also have an administrator role. So. Um, the governance, risk and compliance administrator can get to the framework and can add the threats and things like that. You wouldn't normally have many of those, um, the one ideally, um, but if you are going to have multiple administrators then you just need to make sure you do agree uh, those changes to the framework between, between you. Okay. Right, I won't, I won't add that user but you, you see uh, how, that, how that works. Right, so back to my outline, I'm conscious of the time. Right, so now we want to actually assess some controls. So I'm going to go back in again and show you how that works. So I need to give my user here permission to assess the controls. And um, in fact, I've done that before we started. I gave them automatic permission to assess controls. Um, so if I go to the control assessment menu, then what we're going to see here is all the controls that are applicable to the assets I've put in already. Um, so as you can see, we put in uh, an organisation asset, ABC Corporation, so the very first controls in 27001 are applicable because we have an organisation within our scope. A511, we need an information security policy for ABC, exactly what you'd expect. And then we run through the standard, we've got controls for our supplier, uh, controls for our application, for our, our site, and again for the team. So all of, all of the assets we've put in, the controls are coming up. And I can see them all here in this panel. Um, this, uh, by default, if you say, show me from the top everything, then I can see all the controls I have permission to assess. Now again, you need to allocate these around uh, the different teams in the business. Um, but, or I could drill down, so I could say, take one standard and look at it one section at a time and see the controls in that one section. Depends how you want to work. Okay. So when we actually assess a control, I mentioned that we can configure how we want to assess controls. So I'll show you how I've configured this 
by default. So I'll pick an, an area that's quite easy to follow. Uh, secure areas, physical security. So let's say we want to assess whether or not we have um, physical security perimeter around our London site. Okay? This hasn't been assessed yet, so it's grey. If I click on A, I can then assess that control. Uh, and in the future, what you'll see here is all of the previous assessments that have been recorded, so the history is, is there. So if I'm adding an assessment, uh, what I've configured um, as a scheme here is rather than yes or no, which is very difficult to uh, sort of back up, is I've configured a scheme that uh, forces you to consider the four things that we think make for um, a mature and well-implemented control. Clear responsibility, uh, evidence, documentation, and, uh, and the sense that it's fit for purpose and you know, fully implemented. So we have to assess each of those things. This is the scheme we've defined. So rather than yes or no, I've got to choose from all these options. So in terms of this site and its physical security perimeter, is someone responsible for that? So I'm going to say yes, so I get the full points for that. Is there evidence that the site has good physical security? I'm going to say, well, on the whole. And of course over here I can, I can explain um, what I mean by that, and sort of back up my assessment with the findings from, from this assessment. Uh, is the relevant documentation up to date? Out of date? Probably out of date, normally is. So being real, it's out of date. And do I think this control is fully fit for purpose? It's a bit, a bit more subjective, this, but you've got to leave the uh, internal assessor a bit of room to, to exercise their judgment. Do I think there's some improvement potential? Well, presumably, because there are things here that aren't great. Or uh, is it really bad? Well, I think it's some improvement potential and of course all of these can be customized if you want to have more options or more criteria and weighted so that's how I'm assessing my ISO controls and I'm explaining it here and of course I can also um, link relevant documents if I want to, to pull in some documents from my network and uh, link them to this or from my intranet to uh, to bring the relevant evidence in then I can then I'll have a list of, of related documents here. So the whole point of this is that we are uh, assessing the controls. We're also building the evidence base ready for uh, an audit so that we are we have a compliant management system with our related evidence at hand. Um, so that's how we do it. If there are problems, I can raise an action straight away um, for somebody to deal with um, the problems. I can cast prioritize status, set dates, sign an owner, they get an email. All of that workflow for improvements to the controls kicks in. So um, you get the idea. So if I, if I record that assessment, that's gone in today, 11th of March. It was me, the stream user, who made that assessment. And here's a sort of quick summary in terms of the four criteria uh, of, how, of how well I did. And where there are gaps, there were gaps. And, and the weightings that I put in have given me a score of 74%. So if I just had a slider, I might have said, oh, it's somewhere like that. But this, of course, is much more repeatable and uh, objective because I've had to answer those questions. So we get a score that's weighted, and then that goes into the, uh, into the system. And we continue. Of course, like all these things, if I, if I work my way through, it would take me hours. But of course, you have to assess them, and you can share this out um, appropriately in the business. Okay, I also have... Um, the, a bit of software somewhere here where I can generate some test data. Um, so I'm now going to push in some random test data into the system. That was that. So if I go back to here, what we'll now have, and you wouldn't use this on a real project, of course, what we now have is some assessments for all of the controls for all of the assets. That's the fastest gap analysis uh, ever seen. Um, so there we are. So if I actually look at any of these controls now, then it was created today, I can see the scoring. If I view it, then it does say it's random, which is, which is fine, but uh, the software has just selected some scores, just so I can um, quickly uh, complete that. So having assessed the controls, um, there are certain reports I can look at. So for example, what is my summary? of compliance, bearing in mind I've only put in a few assets, so this is only in relation to those assets. But if I look at the code of practice, 
then I have a sense that um, the controls are progressing. Now, I put in random data, which was going to average at about 50%, which is why we have this sort of thing going on. Okay? Right. So, we have, getting back to the slides, we've done some control assessment. What I wanted to show you at this point was the important difference between assessing a control and deciding if it's effective. And this is a fundamental point with management systems. If I go back to the control assessment, when you're assessing the controls in a standard, like 27001, the control assessment that you do against the clause of the standard, and I'll pick another example, uh, backups. It's a good example uh, of a control that most people will understand. We need to back up our data. Um, we have an application asset, the trading application, and that needs to be backed up, and Stream knows that applications need to be backed up. So this control has come up as applicable. When we're assessing if we are backing up that application, what you're really doing is saying, have we got a process in place? So a gap analysis is typically, is there a process in place? And then the auditor that, that checks your, your work will be, will be looking for you having identified a process for backing up that application. So when I'm assessing that control, what I'm saying is, is someone responsible for that process, for the backup process which is used for this application? Is, it, is there evidence? So is the backup being done? Uh, is it a documented process that I can audit and follow? And do I think it's, it's appropriate, so fit for purpose? So all of those questions are about, is there a mature and, uh, and well-defined and implemented process for doing the backup? They're not really asking those questions about effectiveness, which is something else we need to measure. And 27001 says, assess your controls, that they are in place, and there's a, there's a process there, and then measure if the process is effective. And that's a slightly different type of assessment. And uh, what we do in, in Stream is we assess the process existence here, and then we use key control indicators to measure if the key controls are effective. So if I drill down into my 27001 key control indicators, we have a parallel set of sections to 27001 into which we have placed effectiveness measures. So if I look at backup, for example, then you'll see here the effectiveness measure is what percentage of data is actually backed up and tested of this application's data. So we have a process that allows the backup to be taken, but what percentage is actually backed up and tested and secured off-site and all those good things? That is a measure of the effectiveness. And we've done that for all of the key controls in 27001, all the controls that are really important for treating risks. We've defined metrics like this, which you can then measure. And what will tend to happen is that when you first look at some controls and say, is there a process in place? If there isn't, then you'll raise actions and you'll fix that gap. And then there'll be a process in place. So in future years, it doesn't really help you to ask again, is there a process in place? Because you put one in place. So, so the processes are quite static. What, what changes over time is the effectiveness of the controls. Um, another example, you might have um, the requirement to train information security awareness. Everyone knows that that's a really important key control um, for information security. Train people to be aware of security risks and, and um, thereby don't lose your memory sticks and leave your laptop on the bus and all those good things. So putting a process in place is about defining the syllabus, and having the materials and, and the training schedule. That's the process. Um, but each part of your business, what percentage of the people working in each of these teams have actually been on that awareness training? So that's the, the metric that we can then measure uh, on an ongoing basis. So just tying that into my system here, the control for awareness is actually within HR security during employment. There it is, information security awareness. So I've said that that control in my test data is 41% deployed. So why is that? Let's have a look. So the random test data said no one's responsible for it. <laughs> okay, 
there is some evidence, draft documentation, but it's not really fit for purpose. So that's why I got 41% process being in place. But even when it's in place, my metric is during employment, what percentage of each team has actually been on that awareness training and completed it satisfactorily? And that's being measured for each team. So you see that I'm measuring the control for the business. So the process is in place for the business, but I'm measuring the effectiveness of, of it for each team in the business. And that's something else that we, we I'm picking out here, is that often you put a, put a control in place for a different class of asset than where you're actually measuring its effectiveness. And the stream allows you to, to do that. Okay? Right. So we've talked about that. Next thing we do is assess the risks. And I'm going to do this just in a few minutes and show you um, because of the time. So let's go back to our risk register. So what's happened here as we have been working is we put our assets in, and as soon as we put them in, Stream generated the risks. And you can see that I've got seven risks here. They're grey because they haven't been assessed. Uh, now I pushed in all this test data, so I assessed all my controls, and they're averaging 41%. Okay. Uh, but I haven't assessed the risks at all. Now if I want to assess the risks, I can drill down through the hierarchy here uh, to get to my risks, or I can just click on the register that contains them, and I can see my risks. So I put in an application, uh, a third-party service, a team, a site, and an organisation. Now, there weren't any threats I'd configured for the organisation as a whole. I've configured threats to those more detailed asset types. So it's automatically generated the risks onto the register. So you've taken away the need for um, your staff to identify risks. All they have to do is identify the assets and the risks are inherently, they're there. We know what the risks are because we've configured the framework and we've made those linkages with the different sorts of assets that we're expecting to, to find. So the risks are identified. Now to assess them, I go to the initial view and here's where I can see that those risks are grey because they haven't been assessed yet and I can now recall a CIA type risk assessment for each one. So from my slide, the first way you can do it is manually. So the simplest way, the way that most people would work if it was Excel, is that I want to assess this risk. Let's use, um, uh, yeah, corruption or loss of data. So that's a good one. Let's assess it. Again, no history yet. Um, so now I can decide whether or not I think corruption or loss of data could result in a confidentiality type incident. No, I think really it's more about integrity and availability. So no impact for confidentiality. I'm going to say knowing this trading data is really critical that if there was a loss of integrity, it would be really serious. So I'm going to put that in as a high impact. Okay, now I've configured my own scale. The high impact to me is half a million pounds. It doesn't have to be financial, but that's the scale I've defined uh, in the setup. And I'm going to say if this data was lost, then um, it could be even worse. So that's just my assessment. But again, this is where you need to talk to the business and understand the real uh, scenarios that could cause that and, and document that here. It's no different to um, your Excel spreadsheet, any other risk assessment. You've got to understand the business scenario, but I can capture it in this, in this way. Likelihood wise, um, again, how likely is that? I've got from very low up to very high, um, and I'm going to say that knowing this application and the problems we've had <laughs> so far, that it's going to be high because I know that there's a history of issues with this thing messing up my data. So again, taking into account past experience, but it's exactly the same as with business impact. The software isn't helping to do the risk assessments, giving you the framework within which you're doing it using the, the, the methodology that you want to define in there. Now what I can do is provide that guide. So I can go into my, I'll just store that assessment so you can see it's calculated my initial risk. It's a red risk, not surprisingly, big impacts, and that goes into my register and assessed. What I can do is to help 
my team of risk assessors is go into the framework and say that when I'm assessing a risk such as um, loss of data, I'll pick another one, deliberate misuse by outsiders, somebody actually hacking in and deliberately misusing that system. I can set a typical likelihood. I can say that whenever this threat is considered, I want the default to be medium, unless you want to argue otherwise. So I can give that guidance in configuring the threat. If I do that, then the next time my user is assessing that risk, which is deliberate misuse of this trading application, when they're adding their assessment, they're guided. So the system says it should be medium in our environment. So if I decide to go with that, then it's a guided assessment. Or I can say, well, I think it's worse. I'm going to say higher for this application, and I'm going to explain why. So that's the next stage of automation. There's completely manual, and there's guided by um, how the GRC administrator wants to uh, advise um, the person assessing the risk, which is what I meant by a guided assessment. Okay? Um, and finally, what we can do is automatically assess risks. This is a, um, remember right at the start, I'll cancel out of this one. Right at the start, um, the question was, you know, when do we record an impact profile for our information, for our assets? Well, what I can do is I can do that um, for all of my key information types. So I've designated my information types as my primary assets. Uh, and I put in a primary asset, I said we had some data. So on this screen, as part of my risk assessment, before I get into the registers and do the detailed work, I can record a profile for each type of data that I have in my business. Um, sort of completely separate to the threats that could cause um, the, the security incident. So I can just say, this trading data, regardless of the threats that could affect it, if it's disclosed, how serious would that be for me? So you're just valuing the asset. Um, and I'm going to say, yes, actually, it's quite confidential. So I'm going to say um, it would have a high impact. If somebody changes that data in an unauthorized way, it could be even worse for me. So I'm going to make that a very high impact. And it's got to be available. So I'm recording a profile. And again, you know, you could, you could, you could argue a different uh, assessment but you make your assessment. So I'm assessing the value of that information in terms of security impacts of CIA, completely separate to the, the, the threats. And I, and I can justify that, where that came from. And I could link to some source documentation. So I've now created, in March 2014, an assessment for my information. Hello. Sorry to interrupt you. It's okay. But who is deciding the value of the assets? Isn't it the, mani the, the it's senior the, manager? It's the business manager, yes. So. And who is doing the assessment here? I mean, the assessment here. Uh, well, this would be done by um, someone in the organisation, perhaps an internal consultant or a risk analyst, who is interviewing the business yeah. to get that assessment and putting it in the system. Yeah, but now who is assigning the value now? According to your demonstration here, the assessor, if he is the one who is giving the value or assuming values for the assets. He is taking it from the business manager. So he is interviewing yeah. the person in the business who knows the true value of this information and the potential scenarios in terms of impact if it's disclosed, um, loses yeah. integrity or availability. So, so the information comes from the business. Very important. Yeah, but wouldn't it be easier if the value, values were assigned when we define the assets in the first place? Uh, that, that's, um, rather than, I mean, asking... Well, what the workflow here is uh, identify your assets and then value them. You could do it in one meeting if you want, but we separate those in the way that we've designed the process. That's, that's all. Because it may well be that you, you gather your information types in one exercise and then you sit down with the management and you, you do this exercise to assess them. So it's, it's a separate exercise, and we have it on a separate menu, but there's no reason why you shouldn't cover it all in one meeting. That's just a, a matter of how you plan the work. Um, but um, the reason that we, we separate it on the menus 
is because we consider scoping as part of what assets do we have and we consider the impact assessment as part of the risk assessment. So if you were going to have different people doing that, then we, we have that separation in the roles because we can assign different users to different menus. But if it's one person doing it all, then you just give them both roles. So I don't think it really matters when you do that. But you can't value it until you know what it is. That's the only, the only rule. So, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay, so we've recorded a, a, an impact profile for our information asset. If you want to, you can record a direct impact profile for any asset. You just have to designate it primary, and then you can. But what I've done is I've, done, I've allowed that for my information assets. And what we then do is allow you to link the information assets to the assets that support it. Okay, so what I can do in the linkage is I can say that in London, here, I have some trading data. And I also know that in London, I have a team, an application, a building, and a third party. And I can say, well, are they relevant to this data? Well, yes, because that team uses the data. And this application holds the data. Uh, the building contains the data in terms of printouts and physical media. And actually, this supplier could have access to it. So when I'm assessing the risks to these supporting assets, I want to use that valuation to help me assess them. So what we're doing is we're making linkages and dependencies between different parts of our asset structure to try to automate the risk assessment. Okay? That's what we're doing here. So what I can now do, when I'm on my risk register assessing the risks in London, um, so I'll pick the next one, the next risk that I haven't assessed previously. What happens now is, again, it's blank. I, I could assess it manually, and any guidance I put will come up here. But notice down here, um, is Streams now telling you there's a related impact assessment. So when I'm assessing the risk of someone deliberately misusing this application, there is some related information, and it is the trading data, because I've made the link. Uh, so now I'm being helped to assess the risk by being reminded what information is at risk and how that was considered. And if I want to, I can just use that impact assessment and apply it directly. So Stream is guiding the user on the impact side in the same way it can guide on the likelihood side. Okay, so it's just showing you um, the different levels of automation and guidance that you might want. And that's what, what that is about. Okay, so ultimately we are identifying our assets, whether they are primary or supporting, valuing them, recording our risk assessments, recording our control assessments and bringing it together on, on dashboards. Um, <clears throat> reporting wise I've showed you the, uh, the sorts of views that, that you can get from a system like this and all, they're all maintained in real time so at any point I can go I've assessed uh, two risks here so if I go to my top 10 risks report now for London then I'm going to get a couple of bars there <laughs> because I'm assessing two of my risks um, and the same for, for the business if I look at my control summary then I, again the sort of data I've been pushing in what it's done is populated the areas where I've got assets rather than everything so I haven't put in any quality assets or business continuity assets um, but these sorts of reports uh, you can see but I think the most uh, interesting report is what you see on these dashboards where it's bringing together risk and compliance and if I drill down into London and pick one of these risks so for example the one I assessed fully which was red the risk is still red here. Um, there are five controls linked to it. The linkages are automatic when I define my assets. The controls are 41% on average, but if I drill down, I can see how that sort of random number generator has assessed these, um, these five controls. Some are really bad, some are mid middle, and one sort of looks almost quite good. Um, but uh, the end result of those controls is that risk is still red. And that's the, uh, the point. I can see my residual risk status. Uh, this risk is currently running at, uh, it could cost me £764,000. Um, that's, that's what it could cost me. Uh, corruption of the data on my trading application. That sounds almost plausible. Um, 764. What I want to show you is how I can reduce that risk by 
addressing some of those weak controls. These are the two weakest controls. Um, uh, data backups. 10% of the data is backed up. I couldn't have asked for a nicer bit of random uh, number generation there to give me a good example. If only 10% of the data is backed up, then corruption or loss is a huge risk. I'm going to go and improve that control. It was last assessed today um, by me. I'm now going to say we've made some improvements and actually we're backing it all up now. This is what you'd expect to happen over time. So I'm going to improve the performance of that control. Notice that when I'm assessing a metric which is expressed as a percentage, I enter it as a percentage. Okay, It's a different scheme to suit these controls. I'm now backing up all my data. What happens here is that the, the control gauge creeps up. That control is better. And now, if I go back to the risk, um, I'm now expecting to lose a lot less. So it's all red. So there are other controls I need, but I'm not going to lose 700,000 anymore. I'm going to lose just under 500. So, you know, who can say exactly what the figure is? That isn't the point. What it's indicating is a high risk, and I'm reducing it by treating it with, with controls. It's, it's, it's setting um, a level of risk that management will relate to. The actual number isn't as important as the fact that I'm reducing it down into a zone that is defined as acceptable. So we don't get too hung up about the actual numbers, but it's showing a level of impact that business will understand and, and prioritise. And on my home screen, I can see that I now have still five risks I haven't assessed um, and others that I, that I have. Okay? So the final thing I wanted to, to show you here is how this would relate to risk appetite. The gauge that I haven't yet um, displayed, because it's normally here. Uh, so um, in, the, in my uh, London area at the moment, I've got one risk I've actually assessed. I didn't put a likelihood in for this one, which is why it's coming up. Um, so let's just, let's just say that um, my risk appetite is to uh, lose no more than uh, £100,000 per year out of this whole unit. Now this risk already is saying it could lose me 500. So just with that one risk alone, I'm five times my risk appetite. If I want to graph that and show it really clearly, I set my risk appetite for 100,000 for London. So the first thing I'll do is just turn on the ability to set a risk appetite here. And then I'll go into the tree structure to configure the risk appetite I want for London. And I can set the appetite for any level in the tree. So I'll put that in at 100,000 knowing, of course, that I'm five times that level. So to see that now, notice the gauge now appeared. If I look at the London gauge, then sure enough, I'm running at 493% of my risk appetite for London. Okay, so it's a simple thing, but uh, if you set your risk appetite using the units that you want to in the business for every part of this tree, then I can look at my risk appetite and my level of risk, indicated level of risk, in relation to that for any part of the tree as well. And that's when this starts to get really interesting. So now I can see, yeah, I've got risks I haven't even assessed, but even for the ones I have, with those weak controls, um, far too much risk. And it's very easy to, to show that and see it from the top down and deal with it. Okay, so what I hope you can see here is that so it's actually inherently quite complex as a, as a challenge. There is a structured way to define your business, its assets, and then work through the risk assessments, the control assessments, and see them visualize level of risk and have the workflow that helps that PDCA lifecycle to move and maintain this over time. I do have a, a slide here which just summarizes I won't wade through it, uh, but it summarises the key things that any uh, management system needs to address um, for whether it's 27,001 or any of these standards. Um, asset base, clear links for dependency, doing those assessments, measuring and the effectiveness and the processes around those controls, all of these, uh, all the way through to the key reports that you want and the views, the risk treatment plans, all of those um, some difficult uh, clauses to meet here are addressed in what I've showed you. So this is really for your reference to, uh, 
to have a look at later. And, okay? No, thank you. Very big thank you. Thank you very much.